So thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, is it uh, on my, okay, because I don't see it here, but it's fine. So this is um, a talk that is very similar to the one I gave in San Francisco, although I have changed some of the demos. So this is a tool that we have been working for the last uh, approximately one and a half years. So I'll, uh, I have a lot of slides, but I will actually try to do most of the things in a demo. So uh, this is in the area of testing, as you well know. Uh, and I will introduce the different forms of testing that we have in, um, uh, in general in programming languages and in Erlang in particular. And then I will show with some uh, examples what uh, Concolic uh, testing can do for you and how it easy it is to, to actually use. Uh, and also uh, all the different things that you have to be aware if you're using a concolic testing tool. So let me start by saying that testing is important. Um, I hope that you agree with me. Uh, I think if you haven't tested your program, it most likely doesn't work. And uh, the, most use, the most commonly used method out there is to write some unit tests. Now, the, and there are various X-unit frameworks, including the E-unit framework uh, that exist in uh, Erlang OTP. Now, the problem with the unit testing is that uh, unit testing is that it's typically a manual process. You have to specify both the correctness criterion that you need to specify that you need to have and the inputs that produce that particular output. So you have to specify some relations between inputs and outputs. So most people do unit testing up to a point. I think uh, there is really no replacement for unit testing, but um, it only takes you that far. There are more automatic ways to do testing, as you probably all of you know. In particular, in functional languages, they have pioneered the idea of property-based random testing. And there are plenty of tools out there, in, uh, starting with uh, the Haskell Quick Check, and then uh, the various uh, variants of Quick Check that uh, have been in the Erlang world, including uh, my most favorite one, Proper, um, which I will uh, shortly demo. Now, the problem with uh, property-based random testing is that uh, it's a semi-manual process. You get typically uh, some support for generating random inputs, but you have to specify a property. Uh, and also, if you, <coughs> if you have complicated programs, actually it takes a while to write a proper generator for them. So writing an, uh, something that generates correct inputs is, is something that is not so trivial once you go beyond simple <laughs> examples. Moreover, it's a random process. It doesn't give you any sort of guarantees that your program is correct afterwards. It just might find some bugs, and it typically finds a lot of bugs, and I think you should be using it, but it, you don't really get any guarantee. After you don't find any more bugs, you have actually no clue whether your program works or not. So uh, let's see some demo here. So this is a function in Erlang, my classify function. Uh, it takes some term and checks whether the term is less than 17, and it classifies at small. Uh, if it's uh, between 17 and 42, it classifies at medium, and if it's greater than 42, it classifies at large. Okay, and I think uh, most of you can uh, see that this, this is not a total function. It, there are some cases that it doesn't handle. And uh, I will specify here my correctness criterion to be really, really, really simple. My correctness criterion is that this clause that implicitly gets added by the compiler is not reached. Okay, so uh, I will never throw a bad match error if I call classify. So I have this program here. It so happens that I have it. And this is the classify function. You can see it exactly the same. And I will use proper 
to uh, find out whether this one, uh, if this property holds or not. And the property I will try to test is that for all the n's that are a number, if I call classify, the result is one of the small, medium, and large. Basically, that this function doesn't crash. So I have already compiled this program, and I will run now a hundred tests, and it passes. And another hundred tests, and it still passes. And another hundred tests, and it still passes. Oops, I want ah. Finally, after about 446 tests, I have found the error. Okay, but what about this program? Now, it, I found the error because 42 is a very important number, so I make sure that proper generates it every now in a while, every once in a while. But what about this program here? Will I be able to find this? So let's change the program to have 4711 here and 4711 here. I save, I will recompile, and I will run 100 tests. So let's run uh, 10,000 tests. It didn't find it, even after 10,000 tests. I can run 100,000 tests. It still doesn't find it. Okay, so you have I hope I have convinced you that with property-based testing, you have absolutely no guarantee that you will find the errors that your program has, even though I think if you show this to any of your colleagues at work, they will find you that, uh, that here there is actually two values that you don't handle, not just one. There are two values that you don't handle in this program. So um, now, I have used here a very, very simple uh, correctness criterion. I have uh, said that my correctness criterion is that um, this clause that is the compiler generated is not reached. But of course, I can add my own correctness criterion wherever I want with assertions. Basically, here what's happening is that you have a, a pattern matching failure and I can add whatever assertions I want just with pattern matches. And what about this program here? So if I give it now a list, and I want the, the sum of the list to, uh, to be classified as small, medium, and large based on this thing. So now I need more sophistication for the tool. So, or whatever, I can add whatever assertions I want with pattern matching, in wherever I want in my program, okay? So, for example, with this pattern matching here, you say that I want my F function with some arguments uh, to be returning a list of at least uh, three elements, where the first element is 42, and the next two elements are exactly the same Erlang term. Okay, so I have a very expressive language to also add my assertions wherever I want them. Now, how can we use that sort of thing? We can use it in, uh, with something called concolic testing. Concolic is not an English word. It's a made-up word out of a combination of concrete and symbolic. Now, the nice thing about this technique is that it's fully automatic. You don't have to specify anything. You just run the tool. You don't even have to specify a property that you want to, uh, to verify or falsify. You just find, or you just have to put your assertions wherever you want in your program, or find out whether your program crashes with some inputs. So the approach actually uh, aims to achieve high path coverage. And if it, you it will explore all the paths that there are in your program. Now, typically, this is a very big number, and we're going to see that uh, in, uh, in practice, it doesn't explore all the paths, because that will take in big programs forever. Uh, but it does achieve very high path coverage. So let's see how we can use this thing. So I can write. 
this thing, the cuter tool, and I give it as an argument the module name. It's called DUC. Is there a way to increase the cost? Uh, not this one. I don't know. This is the hugest one that exists in this type of uh, terminal I'm using. But uh, don't worry, because I think it will be very easy to see. So I'm calling the module name EUC with a function that I want to test, the classify function, and I just give it some random input. I've chosen zero here, but somebody else might have a better number to give me. Not 42, because uh, you will find immediately. But let's say some random number. Is this a random number? Yes. So it compiles the file, and it finds you that actually it fails with 4.7.11 and 4.7.11.0. Because the spec I have here is that this takes a number. I didn't even say anything about integers. As a matter of fact, I can, I can say that this is a term. And again, it will find exactly the same inputs that make the program fail. OK? Don't worry about this at this point. OK? Now, what about the other program that I had? Let me. Something like this one. I will comment out this one first. The list sum. So now what I want to do here is um, my function here is called classify L and takes a list of numbers. And I want this to fail if I give it an input list whose elements sum to 4.7.11 or 4.7.11.0. So of course now I have to give it a list of a random number, a seed. A seed. Uh, an empty list, yes, yes, yes. And it gives you now a list with 4.7.11.0 and a list with 4.7.11 and a list of size 2, whose, if you do the addition, you will see that these two numbers add to 4.7.11. Sorry, I don't have a bigger font for those of you that are uh, vision challenged. <laughs> now, what about this one? I can uncomment this one. Now, if the list has length less than four, I classify this as a tiny list, independently of the uh, elements that it might contain. So the second clause is only reached if I have a list of length uh, four and above. Now, I will do that, but now I will run this in parallel also, because Qter runs in parallel. So I will say that I will use four solvers and four polars. OK, so my laptop doesn't have more than, uh, uh, it has only four cores with, and eight with hyperthreading. So it doesn't really make that much. Uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to make to use much more than that. So let me see what it does now. It finds no runtime errors. No runtime errors occurred. Uh, it has a no in the beginning. Sorry, I'm sorry if you don't see it. I see it on my screen, so I don't really know what you're seeing. So let's give it a bigger uh, depth to search deeper in this tree. And let's say I give it a depth of 50. So it finds now an input that is a list of four elements 
that if you do the addition, for those of you that can do addition fast enough, it, it, will, uh, it will add up to 4711. As a matter of fact, it gives me now a, uh, a witness. And if I don't, you know, I can now run this and get the exception. So I have also a case that makes my program fail. And of course, the least sum of this is 4711. Okay, so this was fun. But what about if I do this? I substitute this guy with this. It will it better be the same. It better be the same. OK? This was not something particularly exciting. But what about this one? Where do I have it? This function here, let me take it up so that you see it. What about this function? It's like the previous one, but now it takes a higher order function as the first argument, and a list as the second argument. OK, so are there any combinations of functions of RIT2 that return a number that if you give them then to fall del with a list that has length at least four, it gives you a crash. So how is this called? FL, I think, right? So I just need to write to change a single character. Uh, oops, no, it's not an RIT2, it's an RIT, uh, it's not an RIT1, it's an RIT2, right? So I have to give them a function here. So let me give it a very simple one. It takes two arguments and returns 42. Plenty of inputs that lead to runtime error. Let's see the first of them. If you give it a list 8, 7, 6, 5, and a function that takes 8 and 0, which is the accumulator of the fold L, and takes you to 4, and then 7, the, next, the, sec the second element of the list, and 4, it gives you to 0.0. .0. And um, 6 with 0.0, .0, it takes you to 3. And 5 with 3, it takes you to 4711. If you don't believe it, of course, you can just take this, start the Erlang shell, and just. Oops. Crashes. Okay, so I think I have convinced you that this is actually quite powerful. It's a very automatic testing tool that just requires you to specify the unit that you want to test. 
Here it's just a single function, but can be a whole module below it, or a part of a module, or many modules. You specify an entry point, which is the unit that you want to test, and you give it some random inputs that there might be a good idea to actually make some sense so that you don't also see this as an error. Okay, if you just give it a random thingy here, like rather than giving it this, I give it 42. This will also crash, obviously, but for a different reason. Uh, no, actually, this is the empty list, so it will not even use this. Uh, but say with this list, what happened? Hmm? Ah, yes, yes, I need a list. Thank you, Simon. One, two, three, four. Oops, three, four. Yes. Huh? No, no, this is this fails. It tells you that this input fails also. The input that I just gave. But this fails for a totally different reason because they are not type correct. You try to call as a closure the uh, uh, you try to call as a higher order function the, the number forty two. So you better not give something that doesn't work, because you will see it in the inputs that lead to runtime errors, and you don't probably don't want to do that. You want to see the other inputs. But you can just give it random terms there, really. So how does it work under the hood? So the idea is uh, we are going to do a simultaneous concrete and symbolic execution. That's what concolic means. And during the concrete execution, we are going to collect some symbolic constraints on the program inputs. And we're going to record these co symbolic constraints, and we're going to see which branches they reach. So then these symbolic constraints, we are going to use them to force the execution to go to some other path by negating one of these constraints at the time. So the, it has some nice advantages over both concrete testing and symbolic testing alone, because the concrete execution makes available accurate information about the program state, which may, you may not have without also a concrete execution if you just do symbolic execution of the program. Symbolic techniques for testing, by the way, they have been around since the middle of the uh, 70s or late 70s. So it's not something that has been invented yesterday. And uh, yeah, so you get much better coverage in this way that you would get by random testing tools or by just symbolic techniques alone. So, um, so you collect path constraints as you do the concrete first execution. And then you record variables that depend on the input that have some dependency, typically some control dependency on the input. And you express these path constraints in some appropriate logic, and we offload all this thing to very powerful tools called SMT solvers. Or you can use just a constraint solver if you have one around to solve these constraints and generate now new inputs that will steer the future test runs to explore some unexplored paths. And if we do that sort of thing or systematically, we will eventually um, cover all the paths that our program has. Now, as I said, this is a big number in practice, so you cannot actually do that. But still, you get much, much, much better coverage. And also, all the tests here have the property that each of them follows a different path. There is no like, it's not like random testing where you might be following the same path again and again and again. OK, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. 20, ah, I have plenty of time. So let me now explain how it works under the hood. So let's take this, uh, this example here. I have a compare function that uh, checks its uh, input. It's very similar to the previous one. 
And then I have an f compare function that takes this one and checks whether its result will be GT or LT. Obviously, I'm not handling here the 42 case. And then I have some other uh, function above it that does a list for each on this function. And uh, export only this one, which is my unit of test. So if I run this program, where, I will, where Qter runs this program is in, its, in the core Erlang representation. So I will take what the core Erlang compiler produces, which will be this program. And you can see that it has two failure points. It has the case that I'm not handling here the EQ return from the compare function. And it has a case that it fails here because this function is not handling the 42.0 case, the floating point 42.0. Just to see it again, this does an exact pattern matching with 42, not with the float 42.0. So there are two points in the program where this can, this can fail. And we want to find these two programs automatically. So let's say, um, so if you look at this program, uh, these this functions as control flow graphs, they look pretty much like that. The fcompare function has a branch here, this case, that checks whether the return is for GT. And if so, if not, if so, it returns OK. If not, it goes to check whether it's uh, uh, the return of the compare function call here will return LT. And if it does so, it returns OK. Otherwise, it goes to the other branch and uh, goes to, to the fail label. The same for the other function. <coughs> now, what happens here is that Let's say that we call this with, uh, uh, as input, the list with just 17. So the list with just 17, it will check, do I have a non-empty list? Yes, I have a non-empty list. So I will go to the true branch. Uh, is my uh, input greater than 42? Actually, it's not greater than 42, it's 17. So I will go to the false branch. branch. Is uh, my input uh, less than 42? Yes. So is uh, YGT? Uh, no. Is YLT? Yes. Uh, and so on and so forth. So this will just explore one path and will not find any error with a list of just 17. So now what we're going to do is we're going to pick one of these constraints and negate it. So the first thing to do is here. We followed the true branch, so we had a, um, a non-empty list. So now we're going to negate this and try to get the empty list. But with 17, the list 17 and the empty list, this, doesn't, this is unsatisfiable. You cannot satisfy this constraint. So you don't have any solution that is both non-empty list and empty list. This is not an interesting case. So let's go to the next one. So now I want a list that is non-empty and its head to be greater than 42. Now, this constraint has a solution. Let's say the list with element 40, uh, 54 that the constraint solver gives us, some random value, 54. So now we will explore this path. Actually, this path will not really lead to the error, so let's see what happens afterwards. Now we need to negate this, this conjunction of constraints. Um, we have a non-empty list. The head should not be greater than 42 now because it's the opposite of the other one, the negation of the other one. And the head has to be equal to 42 so that we go to the true branch of this uh, check here, of this test here. So there is only one list that has this property. Um, its head is not greater than 42, and it has to be 42, so it's the list with 42. So we have already found a case where it, it fails, this particular example. 
So by doing this thing systematically, we do this sort of thing, uh, and we explore all the paths. OK? So this constraint here, uh, believe it or not, in Erlang is satisfiable. These are not arithmetic stuff. This is uh, term comparisons. So there is the list, the value 42.0 that is neither greater than 42 nor less than 42 and not, doesn't match with 42. Okay? So that's how it works. I gave you some idea of how it works under the hood, but you actually don't need to know how it works under the hood, uh, most of you at least, unless you want to contribute to its development. So the thing that it's using is it needs to have some st search strategy so that it explores all the, all the paths. So we use some heuristics to, to guide the search towards various points of interest. And we use this depth that counts how many K statements we are allowed to reverse. You might have a program that goes on forever, its execution. So you need also something that makes the testing uh, finite. So you have this D um, this D option that we used here, we did this with depth 50 in this particular case. There is a default depth if you don't specify this option. Okay, let's do one more example. I think it's this one. So suppose that I want to test some module I have written. So in this particular case, I will cheat. I will not write a program. I will use some particular program that exists in the Erlang library, the, the function day of the week from the calendar module. OK, so I want to test whether this function from the calendar module actually works for all inputs. So this is um, the module EUC3. My function is called T calendar and takes uh, three parameters, the year, let's put uh, 2016, the month, let's put nine, and let's put nine, today's date. Okay? So this will run this and give you that this one fails for many, many, many inputs. So it fails for all these possible ways of calling the calendar module. But hey, I mean, nobody really wants to call the calendar module with the empty binary as the first uh, argument. This is not how it's supposed to work. So how, what can we do here? How can we use the tool? Well, we can add a spec. I can take the spec and say that I want to, oops. I want to use this for non-empty integers as years, with months that are between 1 and 12, and with days that are between 1 and 31, which is what you would expect. So let's now run this again.
and it enumerates all the months that, have, that don't have 31 days, they have 30 days. So, that even the type language, the, the message is different, the, even the type language here is not expressible enough to filter out combinations of these arguments that are not valid dates. So obviously we do not want to get this as, uh, as wrong inputs to the function. We want to see if the, the function actually has some really valid date that um, makes it crash. It doesn't handle it. So what can we do about this sort of thing? Well, we can do the following. There, it so happens that in the calendar module there is, a pre, there is a function that says, that checks whether a combination of Y's, M's and D's is a valid date or not. So we want only to check whether the day of the week function works correctly for all valid dates. So now I will write this as my wrapper for my test. I will exclude testing the calendar day of the week with RT3 function with things that are not validates. And of course, you can write your own filter here for all your functions if you don't have such a, um, such a convenient function lying around in your module. So now I can run this. And it will actually find that there are no runtime errors for this depth, and actually for any depth in this particular case. Okay, so you need to add some specs, and whenever the types are not expressive enough to express your real constraints of your inputs, you need to write a filter function that checks the input before it calls what you want to call. There is no error in the testing function. You might, you might have an error in the uh, check that checks. You have to check the valid date before. So here is I can, uh, uh, I can test my valid date before as a different unit. And after I have verified that that one is correct, then I can use it. OK? Now, all this is very nice. I'm showing you small examples here, and uh, some of them are more impressive than others. I also have some really, really complicated ones, uh, which uh, you can see by following the video in San Francisco. You can see, uh, for example, uh, the tool handling functions with a Y combinator, and it manufactures functions that if you apply them to other functions, it will give you something that uh, crashes. Uh, but I will not do that here. I will uh, just show you some real example. I will skip this thing. So, so we'll do a bigger unit here to test. There was an Erlang bug. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, posting on the Erlang Bugs mailing list, when we had the mailing list, uh, last year in May. Uh, and it uh, involved a particular module from the uh, OTP libraries. And the posting is this. Uh, don't have to read all the details. It was by Loic. Uh, and it says, some of my applications won't compile anymore because they have the SSL negotiate next to instead of uh, some other function here. And I get crashes in OTP internal. OK, so it was a compiler bug. It so happens that I have this, which has been fixed, of course, since then. 
it so happens that I have here this module. Uh, I have renamed it to OTP int as opposed to OTP internal so that it doesn't clash with the one that exists in the thing. And as you can see, it's actually quite big. It's not very deep, but it's actually quite big. It's uh, 641 lines of code. So where is the bug here? What crashes here? You know. Of course, you have the posting by Loic, so it, it helps a bit. But let's say that we didn't have that, and we want to actually test it. So this is a function called OTP, a module called OTP int. And the function is called obsolete. And it takes an MFA. So I will use uh, Erlang uh, length with RIT1. Oops, of course, I'm in the wrong directory. So it runs. And now I can explain what these dots and x's mean. These dots are cases where it follows successfully some other branch because the constraints were satisfiable. And the x's means that I'm trying to follow some other path, but there is no um, solution from the constraint solver. The constraint is unsatisfiable. And um, uh, an occasional u, which you don't see here, even if you have very good eyesight, because it doesn't help happen, is that the constraint solver has timed out. So, um, so here we have found a case that if you call this obsolete function with SSL and negotiated protocol with RIT1, this crashes. And actually, will be this, this is the only bug that exists in this module. Because you will see that it finishes for this depth, but actually for any depth. Because here, you just need a depth of 3, actually, to explore uh, fully all the search space. So if you happen to have a 64-core machine uh, lying around, this will actually be much, much faster, believe me. I don't have that sort of thing. And actually, you know, my laptop doesn't have a fan and has overheated, and it's very, very slow. Uh, but um, yes, it takes a while, of course, to fully explore all the paths that might exist in a program, especially as programs become bigger and bigger. But you can explore them in uh, up to a certain depth. So I'm uh, wrapping up here. Um, I would like to say that this is a tool that is available on GitHub. It works for various things. It doesn't work for everything, of course. It's under development. We support 17, Erlang OTP 17 and higher. I would very much recommend the higher versions uh, because we have actually put some support in some modules of OTP for that. So uh, there are various known lim limitations. I will just mention the current one, the, the ones that are the most important. Uh, for uh, We need to add uh, some symbolic uh, information for many of the BIFs that exist in the Erlang OTP library. And we add this information as we uh, happen to hit it. So we don't support all the BIFs yet, symbolically. So you might get something that says, uh, I don't know about this particular BIF. So please, when you get this reported by sending us a program that needs this particular BIF to be exercised. Uh, we don't support maps at all. We support binaries, we support lists, we support tuples, we support integers, floating point numbers, atoms, but we don't support maps yet. And uh, the support for recursive data types that are defined in some other modules by type declarations is still very incomplete. And we don't support concurrency. This is just to explore all the paths in a program. This is not something that you test concurrent programs, really. You test that you have covered all the, all the cases in your program. Uh, 
but this is open source, so contributions are very much welcome, and especially uh, opening up issues that you might have if you tried it. I think I will stop here and I'll take questions. <coughs> Does it handle message passing like called to genetic server? So uh, uh, the question was, does it handle message passing on the generic server? Um, so as I said, it doesn't handle concurrency. So this explores, it will handle uh, receive and send as built-ins. It will handle all the code of the generic server, but it will not, this will explore just the paths that are in the program, not the different interleavings that you might have between processes. This is not something that explores process interleavings. This is explores data non-determinism. It finds inputs for which your program will crash because you haven't handled something in the in the in the pattern matching typically. Hi. Yeah, nice talk. I have many questions, but uh, I was wondering, you mentioned that symbolic testing has been around for many years. I agree with you. And concolic testing has seen some previous work. So what was challenging here of applying concolic testing in a functional language that perhaps... Well, first of all, home, first of all uh, we need, you need to handle uh, all the data types. So we are among the first tools that are doing that sort of thing in the level of a core language. The tools that have been for concolic testing of imper imperative languages are doing it either on assembly, the ones that are for C, or in which case you only have integers, effectively, and pointers, but they are really integers. Uh, and they, uh, or they do it at the level of the Java virtual machine, the ones that are for Java, but they are closed source, so I cannot really tell you more about it because I haven't seen them. Um, here, one of the challenges is to actually do it at the level of uh, uh, language that is much more high level. Second, we ha need to handle higher order functions. And as you saw, we are actually generating higher order functions. We are generating the constraints that will give us the correct higher order functions. I don't know of any, any other tool that does that sort of thing. All right, thanks. And one quick question. What about side effect full code? It will do the side effects. It's concrete execution. Right, you get the concrete, but when you go to the symbolic and you take the other branch, there might be some side effects there that you cannot execute. But the side effects don't affect the, uh, the control flow. But they might. Okay. The every execution is starts from the beginning, so that's not a problem. I mean, if you have some stateful thing, you have to, of course, write a wrapper that does the cleanup and the thing. This is a unit test. And you have to execute the unit test many, many times. Yeah, no, no, I, I So I if it, uh, you know, that. if it uh, sends a bomb and destroys the universe, yes, uh, it will destroy the universe. But that's, I mean, how would you test this thing in, in just unit testing? No, no, I'm not criticizing. Uh, no, it's not a matter of criticizing. Yeah. Is that you have to handle that, of course. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. Well, we can discuss offline, but I don't believe that you know with side effects you might perform quite well. Actually, the old examples were with pure code, right? So. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Okay, but we can chat. I'm glad to chat with you afterwards. Yeah. Um, so uh, the properties that you've been testing now is just if the program crashes or not, but in, in uh, you know, quick shake like stuff, you, we, can, we can specify more interesting properties. So I wonder if there's any support for that. As I said, um, you can specify no matter what interesting properties you have as assertions. So you can put wherever in your code any sort of complicated assertion. And actually, the uh, language that you have here is much more expressive. It's Turing complete language. Right. You can write whatever you want that I want in this particular point in my program that this function returns that. Great. Uh, also, a quick question. Is there anything in the SMT solver that you're using? That, or does it lack something that you would like to have? Is the SMT solver somehow uh, preventing you from testing certain things that you would like to test? So far, in our experience, so far, no. But I'm sure there are. So one of the things we are working right now is, um, I think I had it here. Um, 
We are experimenting with more SMT solvers. Currently, we are using an SMT solver called Z3 from Microsoft Research. But we are um, actually, right, speaking, as, as we speak, we are hooking it to other uh, more advanced for certain theories SMT solvers. So we are generating anyway SMT lib2, which is a standard of all these things. So it's uh, just an engineering effort in hooking it up to many. And since we have the parallel solving any the parallel solvers anyway, it's just a matter of sending some to Z3 and some to Yikes and some to this and that and the other. We don't have any time for more questions. I suggest you come to Cortis afterwards and talk more about it. Uh, round of applause for Cortis Sakonos.